Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm glad you're enjoying the evening. At this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce the current commander of our Pacific Forces, and I thank you so much for giving him your undivided attention. Ladies and gentlemen, Admiral Harry Harris. So uh, thanks for that, and uh, let me just uh, give a, ask you to think back uh, to the beginning of the evening and give a shout out to the Marine Corps Band of the Pacific again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I can guarantee you that not one of the boys at 41 ever took a knee when they heard the national anthem played. So good evening, folks, and a special welcome to all of the World War II veterans and their loved ones in the audience tonight. So, so let me just riff off of Admiral Fargo for just for a minute. So when I graduated from high school, my father gave me two pieces of advice. The first thing he said was, don't go to the Naval Academy. And the second thing was, don't marry a blonde. <laughs> All right. So distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, most people would say that the task before me tonight is a simple one, to introduce our nation's chief of naval operations. But most people aren't aviators. And let me tell you, it's very difficult. It's even painful for us Navy Flyers to talk about anyone other than ourselves. <laughs> but the challenge for me is to convey to you the nature of this American patriot without taking the easy way out and Googling his bio and then simply reading it to you. So please do read his bio, but wait until after he's spoken or you'll miss the opportunity to learn from one of our nation's finest military officers. So let me give you a sense of who your CNO is and how lucky we are to have him at the helm of our Navy and here to speak tonight. In 1982, he graduated from a small trade school on the Severn River called Annapolis to begin his career as a submariner. Since then, he's led our Navy's nuclear power community at every level, including command of the USS Honolulu. How cool is that? right here in Hawaii. He's then led a squadron, he, he's led a group, he's led the submarine forces, and finally he was the director of Navy nuclear power, of, uh, the director of naval reactors, the job once held by the legendary Hyman Rickover himself. Admiral Richardson's also a learned expert in strategy well-versed in the critical nexus between our defense policy and our industrial base. He served as a naval aide to the president. He owes master's degrees in electrical engineering from MIT uh, and the national security strategy uh, from the National War College. He gets the operational imperative, having served as assistant uh, deputy director for regional operations on the mighty joint staff, as a director of operations on the United States Sixth Fleet, and with NATO as a commander of submarines south. Today, he heads the most powerful Navy this world has ever seen, your Navy. And no one, and no one has ever led naval reactors and then gone on to be the chief of naval oper operations. So he's a special leader indeed. He's dedicated his life to defending our nation so that it can be, remain free. Jim Stavridis once wrote a book called The Accidental Admiral. Folks, when the biography of John Richardson is written, they'll call it the Inevitable Admiral. 
We need only look back to our founding, to the words of another well-known naval leader named John, who understood this purpose and inspired Americans to serve. John Paul Jones once said, and I quote, sign on, young man, and sail with me. The stature of our homeland is no more than the measure of ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, I, for one, would sail with John Richardson anytime and anywhere. Well, anywhere except in the submarine. It's to support him as he leads and builds our Navy to be ready to fight and to win so that we can carry on the legacy of freedom won for us by every veteran in this room tonight. He's our Navy's most powerful advocate and the Joint Forces' most effective leader. And I'm proud to call him friend and boss. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Admiral John Richardson, the 31st Chief of Naval Operations. Oh, please have a seat. Please have a seat now. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I just hope that I'm worthy of that at the end of this talk. You know, to thank Admiral Harris, uh, super generous uh, introduction, well more than I deserve, but you read it exactly as I wrote it, so I appreciate that. <laughs> And to all of our uh, distinguished guests, uh, particularly Governor Ige, so I understand congratulations are in order. Congratulations and cautions uh, that I uh, just learned that your daughter is engaged to a naval aviator. Uh, P3 guy, right? <laughs> Sir. All right. Good luck with that. Uh, uh. <laughs> and to all of our other uh, distinguished guests here tonight, uh, Thank you so much for coming out and supporting us. And uh, although it's been done you know, several times tonight already, I think we do just, we, we can't possibly give too many rounds of applause to our Pearl Harbor survivors and our World War II veterans. So let's give it up one more time for them. That's, that's where your standing ovation belongs, is to uh, those unbelievable people of that greatest generation. Uh, before I get started, though, I would like to just uh, recognize just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I want to recognize USAA for helping put on this event. I want, yeah, absolutely. It would not happen without them. Thank you very much. Admiral Tom Fargo, sir, your uh, leadership evident in every detail here as this night has just flowed so smoothly. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Jilla Webb, I will tell you the standards have never sounded so wonderful. Thank you all so thank you so much for that entertainment and for all those encores. I'll uh, pile in on Admiral Harris's uh, recognition of the Marine Corps Pacific Band, although uh, they could have come with a little bit of anchors away, don't you think? I mean, is that is that too much to ask? I, I'm right here, right? So, all right, so. And then uh, a little bit of advice, a little bit of advice to anyone who wants to uh, give a speech is uh, you never want to follow those three vignette speakers from high school. Weren't they magnificent? Oh, my gosh. Absolutely spectacular. So poised, so put together, and their speeches and their family uh, vignettes were just absolutely fantastic. So anyway, just a, a magical night. I will tell you that uh, for Dana and I, my, you know, my wife Dana and I, we are always humbled to come back here and return to Pearl Harbor, uh, particularly since uh, Dana's family is from uh, the islands. Her dad was born on the big island, was here during the attack. And in fact, it was mentioned earlier that uh, the, NRO, the ROTC units from the high schools were activated during, right after that attack. And Dana's Uncle Bill was part of that unit uh, for Kameha schools. And so we really do uh, feel the attachments uh, coming here. Right. Yeah. When we were stationed here, we had the privilege to be stationed here for six years. And we lived on Fort Island. 
uh, which if you go over to Fort Island right now, it's, uh, it's very developed. In fact, it's spectacular, and the museums over there are really something to behold. And so if, during this week, if you haven't had a chance to get over there, I, I really encourage you to do that. But when we lived here in the uh, 90s, uh, it was really just uh, almost frozen in time. It was ex almost exactly as it had been uh, during the attack in World War II. We lived right across the Utah Memorial was in our front yard, literally, and we saw many evenings where colors were executed with dignity and respect uh, over that memorial. Uh, one of the most sort of spine-chilling events that I had in command of Honolulu was the chance to moor uh, my ship in the pier right adjacent to the memorial, which really just sort of gave me such a vivid sense of you know, what it means to operate our modern Navy in and around Pearl Harbor, which is almost just the harbor itself, is a living museum, uh, a tribute to the spirits of the Navy that fought here 75 years ago. In fact, when I was in command of Honolulu, uh, I was in command during the attack of 9-11, and it brought back that whole sense of uh, surprise attack. Right? And uh, you heard so much, particularly from those vignettes, that this was an all-in effort, wasn't it? Everybody came together uh, on December 7th, 1941, to work ourselves through the attack. I'll have some time to spend uh, talking about the Navy, but the people here, the people of Hawaii, uh, all banded together. The blood bank, you heard what a terrific story they had, calling up people, calling in doctors, all of the donors, that participated. Uh, when we got attacked on 9-11, we were about ready to go into the uh, shipyard here, the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard, and we had a chance to get the team together before we even started and brought back the memory of that day of December 7th, uh, 1941, and talked about the bravery of all of the workers there at the shipyard as they came to work, and in fact there's this you know, the USS Pennsylvania was in the dry dock at the time, and the shipyard workers manned the cranes of the dry dock, and they moved the cranes back and forth uh, to prevent the attackers from getting a good line of effort and saved the Pennsylvania. And just a beginning of, a, of a, an epic uh, effort to help the United States through the war. So for everybody here in uh, Honolulu and Pearl Harbor, which is such a magical place, uh, it was really an all-hands effort. And in fact, you can look out on Pearl Harbor. When, when, I, when I had the chance to speak here, I was always struck that you can look out across Pearl Harbor, and in the same field of view, you can see both the USS Arizona Memorial and the USS Missouri together in the same field of view. Almost the bookends of America's participation in World War II. The Arizona here at the beginning, of course, on December 7th, and the Missouri, uh, the place where the peace treaty was signed at the end of the war in Tokyo Harbor. And it always struck me that the combination of these two things together also provided not only a, a calendar, a chronological example, but also a vivid example of the dedication of our service members particularly our sailors, indeed all who served our country, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guard, and the meaning and the power of the vow that they took to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. You know, you've got to think, on one hand, the young sailors on the Arizona who 75 years ago on this night were doing what you do on Saturday night, right? They were probably at a event maybe just like this. They were dancing, they were celebrating, they were coming together with music, and none of them could have foreseen at that time that when they woke up on the next Sunday morning for duty, getting ready for baseball games, getting ready for their duty station, getting ready for just some liberty in downtown Honolulu, that their oath to the Constitution would demand the ultimate sacrifice of them at that time. 
They were caught by surprise in a very short period of time, but even in that surprise, their dedication was evident in so many ways. They manned their battle stations. They manned their guns. They fought back with a toughness that we can barely conceive of today. You know, there's a lot of press, and Admiral Harris mentioned it, about people's behavior during the playing of the national anthem. I will tell you that it is a uh, custom that if you, uh, if you start playing the Star Spangled Banner, you play it until the end. You do not stop in the middle. And if you think about the timing of the attack on that Sunday morning, there were several bands that had started playing the Star Spangled Banner. And it's, you know, for instance, on Arizona, the band played the Star Spangled Banner and they started even as bullets ripped through their instruments up until the minute they had no choice but to run to their battle stations. On the battleship Nevada, they played it to the bitter end. That's the respect that we should pay to our national anthem. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that is a true display of discipline and courage, something for us all to remember today. And as we know, there were 15 Medals of Honor awarded for action above and beyond the call of duty on that day 75 years ago. And many survived, and some of those survivors are with us today. And we think about that sometimes. It's easy to think about, hey, we survived, you know, the survivors of Pearl Harbor. Uh, but if you think back, the reward for surviving Pearl Harbor was that, was that those sailors got to get back into their ships and get them back into fighting shape and take the fight back to the enemy, right? They had to fight on, right? Yeah. And that oath, right, no matter how hard the demands were, they had to continue to live up to the obligation that they took by taking that oath. And so let's fast forward now. Consider the other ship in our imaginary field of view as we look over Pearl Harbor, the USS Missouri. And it was on her decks where the peace treaty was signed to end the war four years later on the 2nd of September, 1945. Four years of extremely hard fighting. And it demonstrates in a different way the power of the oath that we take. So while those sailors on USS Arizona rose to the occasion on the morning of the attack, they ran to the sound of the alarm, manned their guns, and did their best, did their duty. The Missouri symbolizes the power of dedication and perseverance over time of the greatest generation applied over hundreds of days like Pearl Harbor, a power and a dedication that ultimately triumphed in the end. And it's perhaps a measure of that dedication to something bigger than themselves that characterized our fight throughout that war and our approach to victory. So let me tell you another Missouri story in addition to the signing of the treaty. And it shows not only the personal dimensions of the war, right, this was a family affair in so many ways, but it showed how our values applied and triumphed even in the most violent times. This came earlier in April 1945, when the USS Missouri was attacked by a kamikaze. And the zero came in very low, 20 feet off the sea, off the deck, and hit them on the starboard side, just below uh, just 20 feet off the uh, water line. It was carrying a 500-pound bomb. And thank God that bomb on that plane was a dud. It did not explode.
but the plane was torn apart on the side of the ship. And pieces of the plane and the pilot's body was thrown up onto the deck of the Missouri. Now, we don't even have the ability, I think, to recapture what, it, what total war is like. We were in total war at that time. And everything was hanging in the balance, and the fighting was extremely violent and extremely tough. And at that time, in the middle of that encounter, the corpsman on the USS Missouri called up to the captain, Captain William Callahan, and asked, should they wash the remains of that pilot overboard? Now, a quick aside that shows you how small a world it is. Captain Bill Callahan's brother was Admiral Daniel Callahan. Admiral Callahan had been the naval aide to President Roosevelt and had begged the president to come back to sea. The president finally relented. He came back. It was the CEO of the USS San Francisco, another ship who was here in Port Pearl Harbor on the day of the attack. And Admiral Daniel Callahan was later killed in the Battle of Guadalcanal, another Medal of Honor winner. And so here are these two brothers paying the ultimate sacrifice. So back to that time on Missouri. The corpsman's calling up to the captain. They're expecting to just throw this Japanese aviator's body into the ocean. And the captain called back and said, absolutely not. He ordered the crew to take the body below decks and prepare it for a burial with full military honors. Now, at that time, that decision was not popular, right? It was not popular with the sailors and Marines on board, but they followed their orders, and that's exactly what happened. And during a break the next day, it break from some of the most intense fighting of the war, the ship buried that young aviator at sea with full honors, with six pallbearers and a rifle salute. In fact, the ship's bosun's mate had even sewn an improvised Japanese flag to drape over the body as they returned it to the sea. Now, while it was unpopular at the time with many on the crew looking back, we know, of course, it was the exact right decision decision consistent with the values of our nation, that all in that fight were sworn to support and defend. And in 2001, that decision was further validated and honored by a recognition ceremony here in Pearl Harbor, attended by survivors of both from the United States and Japan. And it turns out that when you did the analysis, that aviator could have been one of any three aviators that perished in, on that day. And the three families of all of those uh, young men were there in, here in Pearl Harbor on that day. All three families were there. And in fact, one of the grand nieces of the Japanese families of the pilot that, was, uh, that passed away on that day in 1945 had made these origami paper cranes for every member of the family of the Callahans, the descendants of uh, Captain Callahan. And the granddaughter of Captain Callahan still has her paper crane, and it's one of her most prized possessions today. This is just a small example of our values in action, but a powerful one. And it's the sum total of all these examples of respect, of dignity, even in the hardest of times, that leads us to the present, where the United States and Japan today are the absolute closest of allies. Now, in my mind, perhaps the greatest tribute to the greatest generation was this adherence to our values. And it was borne out no more vividly than at the end of the war. And what I'm talking about was beautifully portrayed by the author David Brooks in a column that he wrote in the New York Times in 2009. And he describes listening to a radio broadcast that occurred on VJ Day. And it involves several celebrities. The, the uh, master of ceremonies was Bing Crosby. Uh, Frank Sinatra was there. Cary Grant, Betty Davis, uh, and many others. And during that broadcast, 
the star, the, the uh, movie star Burgess Meredith read a passage from Ernie Pyle, the famous war correspondent that had been killed just a few months before. And the passage captured the feeling of the nation at the end of World War II. And it goes like this. We won this war because our men are brave and because of many things. Because Russia, England, and China, and the passage of time, and the gift of nature's material. We did not win it because destiny created us better than all peoples. And I hope that in victory, we are more grateful than we are proud. And it was that sense of relief, that sense of humility at the end of such a trying and violent period that is a lesson for us all. And doesn't it stand in such stark contrast to the ostentatious self-celebration we so often see today, so often for accomplishments that are so puny in comparison to what that greatest generation did? So you've heard it many times this, this evening, we must never forget December 7th, 1941. And on a night like tonight, we can ask ourselves, how can we hope to remember and to honor such selfless dedication? Well, a first step is maybe we can recapture that sense of humble service. You know, I'm extremely proud of our Navy team today. You know, this millennial generation sometimes gets some bad press, but I'll tell you, not from me. Our young sailors, soldiers, airmen, and Marines today are the most talented and qualified ever seen. Even after 15 years of continuous war, they continue to raise their right hand and take that same oath to support and defend our Constitution. They are tough, and they demonstrate every day integrity, initiative, and accountability, and they are ready to give their lives if called, and many have done so. Just this week, as an example, the aircraft carrier Dwight D. Eisenhower and her strike group was on station in the Arabian Gulf supporting Operation Inherent Resolve with strikes into Iraq and Syria and providing maritime security in the Middle East. They left on deployment on June 1st from Norfolk, Virginia, and have spent almost the entire time at sea since then. During my, my Thanksgiving, I spent time to the Sixth Fleet and into the Red Sea, and I visited the USS Wasp, who was underway along with the 22nd Marine Expeditionary Unit, the 2-2 Mu, who just last month conducted precision strikes in Libya as part of Operation Odyssey Lightning. As always, every minute since 1960, we've had five ballistic missile submarines on alert, protecting us, providing strategic deterrence and about 10 to 12 attack submarines going in places that, if I told you, we'd have to kill everybody. <laughs> Just recently, the USS Sampson, a guided missile destroyer, on her way home now after providing aid in the aftermath of New Zealand's recent earthquake. And that's just a small sample of what the U.S. Navy is doing today. As you might have noticed in these examples, U.S. Navy does not operate alone, but it does operate around the globe. And the pace of operations has never been higher. But today, our men and women still draw inspiration from the example set by the greatest generation, the, the generation we honor here tonight. And today, we are blessed to have veterans from that generation from World War II here in this room with us, including some that indeed survived the attack on Pearl Harbor and the rest of the war. Veterans from World War II, both those that gave their lives in service to their country, to our country, 
and survivors here with us today, they are our model of what it means to serve. You demonstrated. <laughs> yep. You demonstrated humility and toughness. You demonstrated what it means to take an oath and live by it. Today's Navy applies the lessons of history to combat threats far from our shores, to protect our homeland, and to preserve our prosperity. Today, I am humbled by the call to serve. I am sp inspired by the brave sailors who gave their lives on Arizona, by the heroes that fought in the Pacific and witnessed the peace treaty signed on Missouri, and by all those who raise their right hand and take an oath to serve our country. You know, we are at our best when we serve with dedication and humility in the tradition that you all helped forge 75 years ago. And so, in that spirit, before I close, I have one favor to ask. Before you all lay your heads down tonight, right, we're going to celebrate tonight, but at some point we're going to call it an end of the evening and we're going to go to bed. I'd ask as you put your heads down, you say a prayer for those who fought in World War II, those who paid the ultimate sacrifice in battle, those who have passed away since the war, and those who are still with us today. And pray also for those soldiers, sailormen, sailors, airmen, and Marines deployed around the globe tonight, guarding our peace. Thank you all. God bless you. God bless America. And good night. Thank you, Admiral Richardson. Definitely some great things to think about while we're out at the tribute and the memorial tomorrow morning as well. Thank you for that tribute to the World War II veterans. Um, we have another special surprise for you tonight, although as the night goes on, I'm crying off more and more of my makeup, so don't look too closely. I am especially honored as we move through toward the end of this evening to bring to your attention one of those veterans that the Admiral mentioned who is still surviving. In fact, as I walk around town in Hawaii this week, I hear over and over again about this man, and they say, you know what? One of those Pearl Harbor guys is 104 years old, you know. Yeah. Ray Chavez. Where are you, Ray? You're somewhere right around here. oldest Pearl Harbor survivor at 104 years old, but do not let that wheelchair fool you. He still goes to the gym every day in San Diego. <laughs> 